Hey, uh, I'm Seth Dempsey, uh, co-founder of Configurate.io, and today we're going to talk about the current and future states of internal developer portals. A um, little bit of background on myself. I, I was originally uh, you know, an engineer. Uh, I worked to design and build distributed systems at places like NASA, where we were uh, moving off of supercomputers onto commodity hardware uh, ages before AWS was a thing. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be an engineer uh, and a PM building dev tools at companies like Microsoft and Google. I've also been the CTO of a multi-thousand engineer organization uh, that we moved from uh, an owned cloud uh, you know, data center into a public cloud. Uh, and consequently, we needed to reinvent our approach uh, to improving our developer experience. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk to you today uh, about the story arc of internal developer portals, why they exist, uh, where they are today, uh, and where the product category may be going. I'd love to get your feedback after the talk on this. Um, and the goal is for, for the whole industry really to make more relevant products for developers and platform engineers. So uh, please hit me up in the platform engineering Slack channel uh, on LinkedIn or uh, at seth at configurate.io. Look forward to hearing from you. First off, uh, let's do a brief history uh, of internal developer portals uh, and why they exist. Uh, every great story does have a beginning, and IDPs really began with our collective failure to improve the developer experience uh, as rapidly as we improved everything else that we were doing. Our infrastructure, our tool diversity, our access to tons of third-party libraries, uh, it, it, it didn't quite keep up. Now, a long time ago, uh, it was pretty easy to ship software. You, you built it locally and shipped a binary to customers. But you know, that changed with, with the internet, the web, with moving things to client server uh, in data centers. Uh, and that gave rise to the CMDB. And you know, I think that that's sort of the spiritual uh, uh, precursor to internal developer portals. Uh, but they weren't really intended for developers, They're rather for ops teams. But they had a lot of interesting information in it that was pertinent to development teams that were beginning uh, to be responsible for more and more uh, of their work. Uh, but you're familiar with where we are today. We're all deploying to the cloud, uh, explosion of third-party libraries, tons and tons of tools. And, you know, I, I say it's the best time to be a developer ever because of these things. That said, uh, developer experience has not kept pace uh, with the burdens of what I'm calling shift left. Now, we're asking developers to own what they build, uh, but we fail to give them the tools and support that they need to do it. Uh, developers struggle with things like context switching. Uh, they're toggling between so many tools as they hunt for information to complete tasks that are critical to their every day. Now, back when I was a CTO, if somebody asked me uh, what technologies we used, uh, I, I'd sort of look at them and say, we used, we used everything. Uh, and we did. Some of our developers are using three different CI CD systems. Uh, and, you know, there was an explosion of use of other tools and libraries as well. Um, now, the more libraries and tools and services in our system, this led to significant sort of stress and confusion because developers didn't always know who owned services, where key information about those services lived. It was harder for us to onboard new developers or move people between projects or have discoverability of uh, services that could be leveraged by other people. Now, you know, today, developers and ops are often also gated by ticket ops bottlenecks. Now, this is caused because, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs, you know, you know separate approvals to complete tasks. And you know, this was a very visible uh, problem that, that I faced, uh, you know, in my earlier life. It became a real drag on our velocity because your job wasn't over when the code worked on your machine. It had to work in production, not slow everything down, not blow your, 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 your SLOs or your error budget. Uh, and it became hard. Uh, and, you know, deploying software... Uh, was was actually a new skill, and it still is a new new skill for a, a number of developers. And you know that change can add scope uh, and stress. You know, not to mention, you know, over the pandemic, we now have this with this geo expansion. Some folks were distributed before in in you know a lot of offices, but you know now there's nobody to walk down the hall and talk to. Uh, it's you know you know trolling through documentation in lots of places and you know, getting lucky on an overpopulated Slack channel uh, that, that somebody can help you out. Um, you know, there's another problem that all of this caused as well, which is all of the sprawl uh, that we're talking about didn't just impact engineers, it also impacted engineering leaders. 
you know, our job as an engineering leader is sometimes to measure and manage uh, our, our team to hold people to consistent standards, to make sure uh, that we are uh, compliant with you know, the rules that our company has set up to safeguard the data of our customers, uh, you know, our certifications for things like SOC 2, et cetera. Uh, and this is, you know, this sort of, you know, more, more of everything has led to a compliance nightmare. Uh, at my last big company job, I had a team of nine people whose only job was to try to assess the state of our compliance uh, and sort of efficiency and standards uh, a couple times a year. And it was a real struggle to pull the information together. Uh, it often involved, uh, you know, disruptive, uh, you know, sort of interviews with developers. And if we needed to add something new, it was either a whole other run uh, to all of the teams or we had to wait a couple months for, uh, for the next run to get kicked off. Uh, you know, there's another sort of, you know, knock on problem to this as well, which is that it makes it very difficult for developers uh, to improve because uh, there's no real crisp feedback loop uh, for people to look at. Uh, information is scattered across tools, across accounts, uh, and standards are, are living in documents that may or may not be hidden somewhere or up to date. You know, it's a lot of work to know how you're doing if you're on the right track and, you know, what the next most important things that you can be doing to improve your service are. Uh, you know, and it's not just sort of reliability and architectures and security standards. You know, developers and engineering leaders often, you know, lack the visibility into costs. Uh, in this new world, uh, we don't just deliver features. We have to make sure that we operate them, you know, within the bounds of, you know, what we can spend to service a user account. You know, this is changing all the time. Uh, and, you know, it's just another example of difficult data that we developers need in order to do our job on the everyday. So enter internal developer portals. Until recently, these portals uh, were relegated to, you know, the richest companies. Uh, when I was a CTO, uh, there was nothing commercial or open source uh, available. So, you know, we built something that worked ish for us, but we were never really happy with it. And it was a cost. It was difficult to maintain. It wasn't where we wanted to invest uh, our scarce developer resources. Uh, now, I have had the opportunity to work at some super large companies that could and, you know, did build their own. Sometimes it took many tens of people to build and maintain these portals. Uh, but for many of us, uh, that is not a realistic investment for us to make. Making that investment is, is, is not something our budgets can handle. And frankly, it's sort of out of step with our priorities of servicing our customers. But the good news is we're lucky now. Uh, in the last few years, an entire product category has sprung up uh, and emerged to serve uh, engineering teams of all sizes and types. Um, and, you know, they're serving us with, uh, you know, sort of what I would say an early stage internal developer portals. These portals are offering, you know, some sort of a universal catalog for you to catalog your services, maybe your infrastructure, uh, connect in some of your tools in one place. Uh, they have self-service actions to allow you to, uh, you know, reuse golden paths or scaffold, uh, you know, most of the time. And on top of all of this data, uh, there is an analytics layer, uh, you know, data that's going to help us improve our organizations and standards. Uh, and this is sort of your scorecard features, right? Now, you know, when you're thinking about evaluating an internal developer portal, you know, there are a number of choices today. So, you know, when I think about how do you make these choices, uh, you know, the first thing for me is, you know, I like to think about where I spend my time. Uh, you know, the philosophy I always have uh, for my engineering teams is it's our job to spend our time where we are uniquely capable of delivering value to our customers and then partner with, you know, the right folks to help us out everywhere else. Uh, you know, build, you know, sort of classic sort of build partner analysis uh, on, a, on a piece of software like this. Uh, so how do you do this? You want to focus on the true cost. Right. You want to look through, you know, sort of, you know, the, the 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 website and think about the implementation, the you know, the actual level of effort to not just set up, but maintain uh, these platforms. Uh, you know, we're not building one from scratch at this point, uh, but we do want to make sure that we get quick wins. We want time to value. We want to show other people in the organization that internal developer platforms, uh, portals can really impact our velocity. Um, and we also think about the opportunity cost. What aren't we doing with the resources that we're spending here? Uh, and that's going to sort of, you know, help us understand the level of investment, how quickly we go at it, what tools are matches for us and which ones aren't. 
Um, I'd say the last thing is to think about the trajectory, right? Where Where's the place going? Where are uh, portals going to be in two years, three years? And we're not looking at a snapshot in time. We're looking at vision. We're looking at velocity. Uh, we're thinking about you know, where innovation is happening uh, and if that innovation is in line with where we're innovating in our companies. This is going to help us think about, you know, where we're going to be in two years, where, you know, developer portals are going to be in two years and help us make a good choice. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the early days of uh, CICD. Uh, I remember my first CICD tool. Uh, it was great. It changed the world. Um, but I'm very glad I'm not on that tool anymore. Some people are still on their first CICD tool and love it. Some people are still on their first CICD tool and wish they were off of it. Uh, and, and I would say probably the vast majority of us have moved on to more specific solutions that are tailored to what we need uh, in our company with our you know, infrastructure, with you know, the methodologies that we use to build and deploy and maintain software. So you know, all of these things are important to think about when evaluating uh, you know, alternatives. Uh, so, so that's sort of where we are today. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the future and where uh, where these portals are going. Uh, there's a few areas I think are important. The first is, uh, you know, persona expansion. You know, developers are always going to be the most important folks to use these platforms, uh, you know, uh, without question. Uh, but there is a lot of interesting and important knowledge organized in one place, and there is a pretty rich analytics layer built on top of it, uh, and you know, while developers are going to use this, there are other roles, you know, close roles like enterprise architects or uh, QA uh, engineers or data engineers, and then people who might be a little further afield like security or finance or HR or, uh, you know, compliance or internal audit teams. Uh, you know, you can imagine scenarios where people in these roles, they're already asking and seeking information about technology from the technology organization. Uh, and these requests often involve interrupts or manual ga you know, data gathering today. And, and maybe a self-service portal uh, can help you know, increase the self-service of other roles looking for developer data. Let's take it one step further. You know, these folks may wish to uh, you know, pull data directly into platforms that they use via API. Uh, and they also may wish to expose functionality to developers via the portal. In the same way that self-service actions might allow you to, you know, resize an instance, um, you know, maybe folks in the uh, HR team uh, need you to attest to something uh, about, about where you're working uh, for a compliance regime because you're in finance. You know, today this probably happens via other workflows, but, you know, contextually, bringing this into the developer portal where developers spend their time uh, and, and using, you know, these mechanisms to, you know, effectively merchandise these, uh, you know, opportunities to connect with developers. Developers, it could be a pretty, uh, pretty important thing. So it's important to consider the future users and their scenarios. Uh, and speaking of future users, there's another persona I didn't mention, which are machines. I think machines are going to be big consumers of internal developer portal data uh, to help, uh, you know, departments make decisions. Uh, it's not just a data store. Uh, the internal developer portal with advanced analytics can and will become a decision arbiter, whether you're using it to make decisions on pipeline executions or other portions of the business, you know, not just using APIs to push data into these platforms and make them fresh, but also using it to pull data out and drive other processes inside of your organization. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle uh, is activation. Uh, you know, the future it will bring, you know, refinements uh, and it's going to help tie together the context that you can get in an internal developer portal by the catalog with the relevant scorecards and the relevant actions, right? Because what we really have is a development knowledge graph or data cloud. Uh, and I think we can all imagine that there's a lot more that can be gleaned from the data, uh, you know, to, you know, help developers improve their experience. So we're going to see richer data activation, and we're also going to see contextually appropriate actions. Uh, you know, things that are standalone, actions absent context, I think are going to be the exception to the rule. Uh, as they require us to switch context and tooling, uh, which is exactly what we're trying to get away with, uh, you know, from with internal developer portals. Um, these portals are a journey. They take time. They take energy. And implementations are only going to be as good as the energy behind them. Uh, I think about old lift and shifts from data centers to clouds. Yes, you're in the cloud, but are you really cloud native? Uh, same thing with uh, developer portals. Uh, if you set it up, 
Are you really portal native? No, it's a change in philosophy for how you do business as development organization. Uh, and you can do it in incremental steps, right? You're going you're gonna to win in some places. You're going to get network effects from the data, uh, from the value of what's in the platform, and it's going to spread to other roles in the development organization uh, and throughout the enterprise. To summarize, uh, I'm hopeful that this talk was helpful, uh, you know, for you to better understand the history of internal developer portals, why they exist, where they are today and where they're going. You know, the category of tooling is, you know, extraordinarily useful for organizations that want their developers to move faster. We all do. Uh, and we want them to be, you know, doing it in consistent ways, using self-service actions, reusing knowledge. Implementing an internal developer portal doesn't have to be hard. Uh, and it should be impactful to your organization pretty quickly. Over time, these portals will become even more useful uh, to developers and to other important stakeholders who currently aren't even you know, conceived of uh, as users uh, of this data and these tools, um, both machines and humans alike. So, uh, you know, if you're like me and believe that a vibrant ecosystem is important to support the evolving needs of platform engineers, uh, please get in touch with me. Uh, I'd love to meet you and hear your feedback on the pain points that you're having, what you think the vision of internal developer portals could look like. You know, hit me up in the platform engineering Slack channel, LinkedIn, or uh, email me at seth at configurate.io anytime. Thanks so much.